day to day. We have three great presentations, um, two use cases. And then the first presentation that you can see on the screen here is from Morten Hansen. He is our lead integration and interoperability engineer here at the University of Oslo. Uh, after Morton's presentation, we have Lauren Theus and Dr. Chinseli from uh, Lao uh, presenting on the integration with M Supply. And then after them, we'll have a short five minute break and then we will be joined by Nuno Reinho and Laundry Medigan. Uh, from Medexis on their integration and interoperability with DHIS2 in Burundi. So today is jam-packed full of really interesting interoperability and integration use cases and, um, and lessons learned. Uh, so we, uh, we're, we're excited to be able to present all these to you today. Without any further ado, Morton, I will go ahead and hand it over to you and you can take us away. Sure. Um... Welcome everyone. So I'm, uh, as uh, Scott was saying, I'm, I'm Morten. I'm um, the lead of the, the DHS2 integration team. Uh, I'm also working on the platform team uh, and all the APIs and everything around there. Uh, we all, I, I'm, I was thinking probably yeah, we'll do about 20 minutes presentation and then we have about five minutes at the end for some questions. So if you have anything, please, please wait and, and in the last five minutes we can have a bit of question time. Uh, just want to quickly go over um, the integration team itself. It is, it is, it's been around for a little while now, but there hasn't really been um, maybe too, too, um, too, too public. I mean, I don't, I don't think everybody knows about it. I think <laughs> so. Some of the people was mentioning this is the first time they've seen this email address. Uh, we have an official email address now. If you have any kind of integration questions, API questions, and so on, uh, the team is currently just me and Bob Jolliffe. Which probably most of you have heard about before. Uh, we do have weekly calls every Friday. Um, if you have something you want to kind of discuss with us in more detail, you can join those meetings. Just, just send an email to us and we can invite you. Um, we are more and more getting a, a part of the OpenHIE community, which is a community for creating kind of health, open health stat standards. Um, and and, and in, in, within that, we are part of um, the HMIS working group or the, the Sub, subgroup. Um, we are also um, part of the facility research group and from time to time we also join the COVID group. Um, so if you're in interested in that, just please feel free to re reach out to us. Uh, anyone can join these this meetings, they are quite open. So if you have anything you want to bring up, uh, feel free to do that. Um, we are also working on different kinds of emerging standards that are linked to this open HIE project, uh, stuff like MCSD, which is for exchange of uh, organization units. Uh, um, and it, it basically a profile of uh, what's called FIRE. FIRE is a standard for doing health interability. And MCSD is then a profile of that um, um, linked to um, doing org unit exchange, basically. And then we also have SCCM, which is uh, the same um, kind of profiling of FIRE, but this time it is tailored towards uh, option sets or code lists or value sets, or whatever you want to call it. And then the last one is ADX, which is for aggregate data exchange. Um, so that's basically a standard to do um, exchanging of aggregate data. So in, into the issues to other issues to, um, and, and that's already been used uh, in a few places. Right. So again, just a very, very quick overview of what we have. So, so these are two APIs. We, uh, so basically, everything you see inside of DHS2 today, the way the way kind of the, the DHS2 apps work, um, are using the same APIs as you will be using if you ever, if you're ever going to do any kind of integration with DHS2. So, for example, if you go to the data entry app, um, the underlying the app itself is actually using the same APIs as you would do if you want to do say a bulk import of data values to DHS2. It's kind of, so 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 we are very much um, kind of using the same APIs. Um, that as, as you would do for, for integration. Um, we do have um, kind of a three separate APIs for data. So the, obviously it's the, the aggregate, aggregate one, um, which probably is the one that most people are maybe already f f familiar with. There's a tracker one for creating the entity instance, for creating enrollments, for creating events linked to enrollments. And then of course we have the event itself. And the event is of course, when I talk about event in this case now, I just talk about the, what we call the non-registration event or anonymous event or 
you know, this kind of uh, just a free form event without any linkage to a, a, a patient or a person. For the metadata, again, um, everything that's available for you through the maintenance app is also available to you as part of any kind of integration work you want to do. Uh, typically, uh, maybe you want to get, say, um, uh, a very common scenario is, for example, you want to get every week, you want to get kind of maybe a list of every metadata that has changed that you can do with what's, what's called the object filtering. So, for example, maybe you have a job that every week goes into the API saying, okay, give me all your organits that has changed or been created since a week ago, and then it will give you that, right? Then and on top of that, you can also do uh, filtering of the fields. So you can make sure that you're only getting the fields you want. Because by default, in many cases, uh, the, the API is actually hiding data for you, right? So um, it, it doesn't want to just give you everything by default. You actually want to hide as much as possible. Then you can ask for what you want to do. Uh, I'm not going to demo that now, but if anyone wants to demo, that's very quickly to show you. But uh, um, yeah. And then the formats. Um, so. My suggestion is that if you can stick to JSON, please do that in all cases. Uh, it is definitely the one we have tested the most. It is probably the, the way forward and the one that, well, that's getting the most uh, focus. We do support XML, um, not in every case, but in most cases we do support XML. So for example, for the aggregate, we have an XML version of the aggregate. We have XML version of the tracker, although that is going away. I just want to mention that. And we do have an XML version of event, which is also going away. It might be added back, but um, the, the next iteration of the tracker APIs will actually remove XML support. And then we have CSV support in a very few kind of special cases. So for example, you can import say, option sets that is supported through CSV, or if you want to create data elements, that's also supported through CSV. Um, the reason we don't have CSV for everything is that CSV is very much a tabular format. And when it starts talking about stuff like the tracker, that payload is very complex. So it would be a very strange looking CSV, basically, if you want to kind of push all of that into, into that CSV. So uh, we do support some cases. And if you just go to the documentation, you can have a look at that. But again, um, I would, I, for, for my, from my point of view, uh, you should focus on the JSON. Uh, obviously, CSV is very nice if you're doing something in Excel and you want to export that CSV. That's just kind of like the, the common use case for doing CSV. All right. So um, I just basically, uh, the rest of the time, I'm just going to talk about a couple of ways you can send aggregate data into DHS2. Um, so we had two ways of doing that. Uh, they are a little bit different, uh, but they kind of accomplish more or less the same. So the first thing I want to talk about is sending uh, what we call a data value set. So what is a data value set? Well, it comprises uh, of all the things that require for data value. So that would be in the organit, the period, and then a set of data elements with a value. So that might be say 2020 CR1, which would be January, organit, something, and then data values, and um, uh, yeah, data element UIDs basically. Um, but since this is data value set, so why this is not just called a data value is because it is also linked to the, a specific data set. So that means that whatever you have in the data values array must be linked to the data set um, UID. So uh, you can only kind of send in the data elements that is part of the data set. And on top of that, we have something for data set when you kind of done with entering data, you have something called uh, the complete date, right? You know, go into the data entry app, you click complete, that, that will send a date to the system and say, okay, now this data set is completed. So this API allows you to do that. Um, and then the second one is the API for sending multiple data values. So now you will see it looks a bit different, right? So Gone are the completeness, gone are the data set. That is not there anymore. So the reason we had data set here, it was a little bit about validation of the data values, but it's actually mostly about the complete dates. But the limit here, as you can see, you can only have one period at a time, one organ at a time, right? 
So it does not like to send um, a kind of payload that uh, spans multiple organisms, for example. So if you're doing, say, an import job and you have a, a, a MySQL database somewhere or you have some kind of data somewhere that you want to get into these just two, you don't really want to limit yourself to sending one on one, uh, sending data per period per organism, right? That will take a lot of time. And that's not really how you want to do it. So this, this that's the downside of this one. The, 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 the positive side is, of course, that you can actually complete it. So if you, maybe you have a, like a running, uh, almost like a real time uh, integration that you just, whenever there's small data in your in your other, other system, you kind of immediately want to just send that to DHS2, sending it as completed, done. That's very nice and that doesn't work fine. Um, but again, if you have a larger job, maybe you have some historical data, you probably want to use the second format. So the second format, you will recognize data element, the period, the organit, and the value as before. There's also a comment if you want to add a comment. Um, this, is, this will be show up if you uh, go to the data entry and you double click the input field. You know, you get this kind of the historical values and everything. And there's an there's a, there's a input field there called comments or description or something. Uh, and this is where that comment will end up. Uh, and, and of course, here there's only one single data value. But this array, you can have as many variations here as you want. And there's no, no limitation when it comes to mixing different organites, uh, different um, uh, periods, and so on. And you can just have a mix of whatever you want. And then you can actually create that, that big, big file if you want. And you just send that to DHS2. And you properly fill in the values for all your organites and all your periods. Um, so depending on what you want to do, uh, you will have to kind of choose that right approach. Okay. So I think it's already time for demo. Um, let's close down the screen. One more time. Let's find my there. So I already have a uh, DHS2 running on my uh, my local host. Let's log into that one. Should I zoom in a bit? Or can, I, can everyone see? Yeah, it'd be helpful if you zoomed in a little bit. I would have to do that. Let's see. Is that better? All right, let's that, that's, uh, that's assume that's better. OK, so um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of select a data set now. And, and we, we can, we're going to see how we can send data for that data set. So, um, I already, of course, pre-selected that. So let's go into uh, the data entry app. I have selected some, uh, in this case, I will only send for one organit in, in, in both demos, but uh, obviously you can also change to have different organits. Uh, the second demo will also show how to do multiple uh, periods, but let's start, start with this simple one. Um, so the one I selected was the mortality under, uh, under five years. And let's go back a few years, um, right? So as you see now, there is no nothing here at all. There's no data. So the question is, how do we then send some data to this one? So now we're just considering one single data entry. So that would be uh, one organit, one data set for one period. And we also want to make this completeness happen, right? So we're not going to send a value maybe for all of the fields, but we're going to send a value for some of the fields. Now I have the demo obviously already prepared. I can just show that here. But maybe you are like wondering, okay, so I see that you have the period here. This is January, but where did you get that UD from? Where did you get that UD from? Well, I will show you that. So if you have worked with the digital API before, probably this is. Uh, very straight, straightforward for you, but uh, let's, let me do that anyways. So, <coughs> it's, um, I'll, I'm not going into the kind of the final details here. Um, let's call it down. Uh, it's Angela. So, if you our APIs um, or our um, API organization unit endpoint does have a list of all 
all of the possible uh, uh, organisms in the system. Now I, I just turned off paging. I kind of did a did a bit of a cheat. I just searched for for that that directly. Um, you can also, as I said, you have what we call an object filter. An object filter, you can do something like uh, display name uh, like uh, Angela, which is not perfect. You have to do uh, right. So it's it. I I'm, I don't think I can I can maybe zoom a little bit. But if you just look here. Again, this is all documented, so don't don't worry too much about that. But we have a filter here where we're saying we want the display name to contain Angela, right? Basically, it's a like you can compare that to an SQL like. Um, in this case, it is case sensitive, but but we also have an uh, I like, which is not non case sensitive. But, but let's not worry about that right now. Okay, so we wanted the CHC, so let's just take that and. What are APIs? Okay, so now we have the full information. We don't really need all this information now, but at least now we have it. So the next step is to find a data set. And you can kind of use the same kind of approach. Again, big list of many kinds of uh, data sets. Uh, this is, in this time, let's not, uh, let's not spend some time on actually doing the filtering. Uh, we don't have that many data sets here. So let's just take this one. You see it's actually exactly the same. You add that slash. Endpoint, and again, you get the full information that includes all the data set elements, all the assigned organites, and so on, so on, so on. Um, let's not worry too much about that right now, but we got the UID, which is what we wanted. So, this is how we got that one. Um, the complete dates, uh, well, that's you can understand what that is. So, basically, uh, this is the January 2014, so maybe you completed that in the next month. Obviously, you, you can change that as how you really like that. That's kind of specific to what you want to do. Um, so let's not worry too much about that. Um, but we have a set of data elements, right? So let's not dig too much into that right now. But I want, want to show you one thing. Um, well, actually, let me wait with that. Let me just show you how to send this. Uh, let me just create a new terminal. Um, So I'm going to use a tool called uh, curl. Uh, you probably have it on your uh, on your machine already. Um, there are many ways you can do this. Like you can also use something called Postman, uh, which is a bit more UI. Um, which has a bit, bit, bit nicer UI, but but um, yeah, it's it's really up to you. Um, there are also some plugins for for Chrome uh, if you want to use that, um, but but I think for now we're just going to use curl. It's a very straightforward tool. It's basically a small HTTP client that allows you to send send some data. Um, I, can, I can I can probably share this stuff after. I assume we have some play, 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 a place where you can share files, so I will also upload upload this later. Um, so let's not worry too much about these scripts. I just have some scripts here that can do that that for you. Um, but let's let's just do it manually now, just to show how the process is. So you, obviously, you also have to give a username and password. Um, as way as any time you, of course, talking to DHS2, you also have to give some username and password. That that makes sense. Um, you need to point to the file you want to send. So in this case, that's data value set um, JSON, and then you have to do this at sign that means include this entire file. You have to tell it what you're sending. So by default, it, it it doesn't guess. So even though you're thinking, oh, I'm sending JSON data, it should, the system should know that. For the system, it just is a set of characters. It doesn't really know anything about it. It's just going to say, okay, they have they have some some bytes, uh, but you need to tell me if it's JSON or if it's XML and so on. So you have to set the, what's called a content type. That means this is what I'm sending. So that would be um, application JSON. So now we're saying okay, this is my credentials. This is the file I'm sending, and this is what I'm sending. So now we just have to say where are we sending it? Well, in this case, I'm just sending it to my local machine. So that would be localhost API data value sets. So that's that is the endpoint for sending this kind of data value sets. Okay, this looks fine. Um, hopefully, this is a live demo, so hopefully nothing will go wrong. And it did. Um, 
This is probably okay. Okay, let me try it out. Yeah, there are some. I'm running a not. Uh, I'm running a, my own version of, of this as two now, so it might be some some issues. But as you see now, you will get this very long. I can let me make it a bit nicer. Um, you, get, you will get this kind of imp, what they call the import summary back. Um, now, of course, I, did, now I send this one more time, so it was now updated. And I, I took these three values and updated uh, the values. Um, the first time it would actually say uh, imported three. Um, it said import process successful, data set complete date. That's now 2015, this is what you had here. And obviously, if you go into the documentation, you will see there's a bunch of options, the many, many things you can do. Um, everything from skipping the car, skipping auditing, uh, being more strict when it comes to data element validation and so on. Um, but you will actually get the actually used uh, import options back, which is kind of nice. So that, then you know exactly the options that were used for your import. Uh, so let's go back to the issues too, and let's verify that that data now exists. So I just switched to February and then I switch back to January. And you will see now we have the one, two, three. Uh, as we are hoping for. Okay, so we have already 11.24, so let me uh, just jump to the next demo. So this is working now. So this is the way you, let me just see here also, it is completed, as you can see. This, is very, this very much mimics the way a user would enter data, then click complete. Um, so that is all um, verified now. So let's go back here, and now we will have a look at the next one, which is the data values. And as I told you, using data values, now you can actually have a mix of different periods, different organites, and different data elements. In this case, we're not doing that much, but we, we do have, as you can see here, we have different periods. So I'm sending the same uh, three data elements as we did before, but this time I'm actually uh, sending it all, all the three for three different periods. So this is uh, uh, June, July, and, and August um, for 2014. Okay, uh, and then the sending itself is, is basically exactly the same again. Um, there's this, the same endpoint and, and all of that. The only thing that has changed is now you have, to, of course, have to point to the, the other file. So that would be now uh, data values.json. Um, so the system we recognize, uh, it will actually try to, to see, do we have a data set in the payload? Well, we don't, we just have a list of uh, data values. Okay, then we go to the data value format importer, right? So that's it. It's saying now success. So what actually happened here? Well, imported nine. Uh, so imported means created, by the way. Just so it, it's, it can get a bit, bit confusing. I wish we actually used created and not imported, but um, what, what really happened now is actually it did uh, create nine new data values in the data value table. So if I send this same again, you will see this time it updated them. Okay, and let's just verify that. So again, we have the same organite and data set here now. So we, we don't have to change that, but now we should have data for June, July, and August. Go to June, we see we have data. July, we have data. And August, we have data. So the last thing I'm going to show you before I finish is that it is also possible to clear values. If, for example, you sent some values and I think, oh, oh no, there was something wrong there. It was actually not meant to be sent. Um, you can actually uh, fix that by changing what we call the import strategy. So I didn't, I didn't test it before the demo, but uh, it should be, should be fine, hopefully. So as you see now, if you remember, if I just go up a little bit, you will see that the de it defaulted to import strategy create an update. Um, which is fine because that's usually what you want to do. Uh, but this time I actually want to blank out uh, a set of values. So using the same payload, uh, I was changed the import strategy to delete. And if you go in here, I didn't print the printer this time, but you will see we actually deleted nine data values. So now if you go back here, say to June, the values are gone. So this is how we can and, um, orchestrate a data exchange for the aggregates. So from time to time, you might send something you shouldn't have sent, and and then and there is there is a fallback to easily kind of remove that data again also. 
uh, obviously uh, in the slides uh, I have linked uh, with my slides now I have linked um, to the appropriate documentation so for the aggregate this link to the aggregate documentation tracker this link to the tracker documentation and so on so when these uh, slides are shared you can just go here and you can click on that um, and you can you can figure out the, the documentation and uh, the documentation is on uh, docs Python, not Python, obviously, <laughs> docs of dcs 2org That's kind of our landing page for all, all kind of documentation. And uh, this is under the developer documentation, the developer guide. You can see a web API. This is like the, the full, full API. So this is everything. OK, I think we are only two minutes before you should shut in. So I think um, if there's any questions, I think that would be the perfect time for that now. If, if not, we will hand it over to um the the law team um yeah morton thanks so much that's a great presentation uh, a couple of questions did come through the first question is can you talk a little bit about our connection or relationship with open him uh, we saw yesterday that his malawi um, and the ministry of health in malawi have used dhis to or have used open him to connect dhis to and open lmis could you talk a little bit more about that relationship or if any advice or guidance on using OpenHIM? So uh, we haven't really used Open, OpenHIM much uh, in, in, from, on, from our side. So, I mean, OpenHIM is basically a mediator that allows you to um, kind of orchestrate uh, kind of, you know, a typical thing you would have. Uh, okay, we have a, a deploy container that will get data for DCS2. Then we have another container that will um, kind of do some transformation on that and then basically sending it somewhere else, right? So um, it, it's, it, it's pretty straightforward to, to use that open him if you want that. Uh, we haven't, uh, we don't really have any recommendations to use it or not to use it. I, I know uh, it is linked to the open HIE project. Um, so if you like it and it does the job for you, that, that would be perfect. It does support storing of credentials and these kind of things. Um, but again, that's just an orchestrator, so it it it's, it's, it can be replaced by by other components also. Um, I, I didn't I wasn't part of any uh, well I didn't watch any demo um, from yesterday, so I'm not sure about exactly that, uh, and 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 how that potentially could be used with Open LMIS. Um, so yeah. Right. Okay. Time for one more question. Thanks for that answer. Um, in the this is coming from Robert Modi. He's asking in the first template, does specifying the complete data automatically mark the data entry complete? Yes. You mean uh, you mean the, the complete date, right? So um, mm -hmm. that 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 that's the completed. I, 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 or speci I, uh, specifying the complete date date does that automatically yeah. mark the data entry complete? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, Morton, we will let you know if there's any other questions that come through in the community practice. Please, everyone, still put your questions here. We can pass those along to uh, Morton. He can answer them here directly as well. Uh, now we are going to hand it over to uh, Lauren and um, take us through the um, LAL case study of interoperability with M Supply. So over to you, Lauren. Great, thank you. I'll just go ahead and share my screen now. Um, we're kind of co-presenting this from two different locations, but it should be good. Good to go with this. So one moment, you can see that now. Yep, looks great. I will just briefly start my video to say hello and put a face to the name. Um, well, we still have light here in Lao, but Basically, my name is Lauren Tice, and I'm a program manager with the health system strengthening team with um, at Chai Lao, and so we provide support to the Ministry of Health. So I'm honored to, to introduce Dr. Chancellor Pomavong, the, the Deputy Director of the Department of Planning and Cooperation at the Ministry of Health, which oversees DHS2 as it's implemented in Lao. And we're excited today to, to give you a little bit more of an example of how the M Supply DHAS2 integration has worked here in Laos so far. Um, so thank you. But but for now, Dr. Chensley will give a bit of an overview of the context of uh, the HMIS here, and then I'll go into more integration details and examples with our malaria team and, and applications of the use here. So Dr. Chensley, I will hand it to you now, and I'll, I'll move the slides along.
Dr. Chensley, if I think if you are able to unmute meet yourself um, for me. Um, Martin, I think we have to make Dr. Chansley a co-presenter. Yep, we will do. Uh... Okay, can you hear, hear me now? Yeah, loud and clear, thank you. Okay, you hear me now, right? Hello? Yes, thank you, Dr. Yes. Chansley. Okay, Roland, could you please go to next next slide? Uh, another another slide next. Okay, so I just brief to you on the uh, Lao is uh, population is about seven point two million, and also we have the uh, GDP per capita is about two point five thousand uh, super five hundred forty two. Thousand US dollar, and we have life expectancy about 64, 67, based on the census 2017, and we have maternal mortality is about 164, 167 uh, per 100,000, and also under five mortality is about 42 uh, per 100,000 uh, kid, and also health insurance cover about 80 percent according to data 2019, and number of Ethnic city is uh, more than 50 ethnic city. Next, Alan. No, okay. So uh, actually, we have uh, in 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 the in in the past our country we 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 have uh, the problem like uh, uh, expire of the some of the uh, medicine and also we have stock out some of the malaria uh, uh, drug and also we have. And on the other, on the other hand, we have expired of the HIV uh, treatment uh, uh, drug. So this is our, our program. Next, uh, Nolan. So that's why the country we are implementing the the uh, M supply system or electronic uh, uh, logistic management information information system, so that we can get rid of uh, that problem. So M supply actually is a desktop based application that used for use uh, of offline and synchronized to central server access via online client. So what uh, since we already start implement the uh, M supply since uh, 2019, and there there are more than 188 uh, uh, the uh, warehouse of the country have uh, has been starting apply M supply system. So amplification is is uh, good because they have uh, we can have uh, receive and ag aggregate supply uh, invoice also uh, create and aggregate customer invoice and also capture or and calculation of real time stock on hand so that we can we can get rid of the the, the two pro two program of the as, as I mentioned the stock out and also the expire of the of the uh, uh, Medicine. Next, Lauren. Could you go next? Oh, okay. So on the other hand, aside from the M, M supply system, in the country we also start implementing uh, electronic uh, uh, information system. We apply the so in the system, which is starting from already since 2014. When we start, we just apply uh, this uh, this SSO to only for uh, collecting information like OPD, IPD, and also key key uh, indicator for MCS indicator. And then later on, we also try to integrate it with other program like uh, Malaria TV and history into the system. And then here in 2020, we start, we start also thinking about to, to continue to integrate the uh, server and system into, into the DSS2. And also we also expanded uh, system into the uh, health center level so that health center can enter the data by themselves. And especially in within the DSS2, we also apply different different level, some aggregate, uh, some event capture, and we are also moving to the tracker now. 
for some of the key uh, vertical problem. So now the system uh, uh, is, is, is only running in, in, in the country more than five years. Next slide, Lauren. So we know that uh, we work separately between the headset two and also M supply. We, we didn't know we, we work separately. So uh, many, many programs try to use the SS2 for the, for the, uh, M -sup for the, uh, uh, for the medicine and also for the uh, uh, malaria, uh, uh, malaria medicine. So we work separately between M supply and also the, uh, the, uh, uh, the SS2. So next, next slide. Next slide, Nolan. So now we try to integrate it. We need to put in together between the uh, DSS2 and also L supply so that we can have one platform can we can use DSS2 for the generate information for both for the M supply uh, medicine and also for the uh, linking to the to the uh, program, DC program and also service program into the same uh, the same thing. So, so Lauren, I will hand over to you to continue. What is what is technically how you can bring between the between the M supply and this is to what is useful for for this uh, uh, moving from uh, putting integrated two systems to, together, which we call interoperability between this is to and the M supply. Please, I hand over to you, Lauren. You can continue the the presentation. Thank you. So as Dr. Tunsley was saying, you know, really our M supply system, um, which is used within warehouses for stock management is really effective and the, the right tool for warehouse management where we look at real time stock on hand data issuance, kind of distribution history, as well as very detailed levels um, of data about you know, the, the stock itself. Um, and DHIS2 is also really fit for purpose for these national programs that are looking at the bigger picture case and testing data and coverage amounts um, for the population. So each of these systems is incredibly effective for kind of different capacities of their user base. But really we've noticed that each system can, can become even stronger if the information is brought together for decision-making. And one example of where this is essential and, and really the way that, you know, there's shared stock, there's, stock responsibilities across national programs in Lao versus the central um, warehouse team. And so there has to be a lot of communication between the two. And this comes together with the, the commodity distribution plan where based on estimated case and, and testing burden from DHIS2 that we can see, as well as practical, you know, practical components of how we're able to get stock into warehouses, facilities, hospitals, um, it's, it's important that we bring this information together from both of our systems to calculate appropriate distribution needs based on each of these pieces. So in order to do that, we and the ministry overall supported the development of an API to push key M supply data to an aggregate DHIS2 form on a, on a weekly basis. So we work closely uh, the Sustainable Solutions is the M Supply provider, and so it was their team that built this API. But I think just going back to to what we um, saw in the last presentation, we looked at each of our org units. So each warehouse in the country is an org unit in DHIS2, um, and so for each of these warehouses, we've identified the highest priority commodities, starting with about 200. Um, out of over 4,000 that are managed within M Supply, um, and selected these to be pushed to DHIS2. So this happens every seven days uh, right now, and, and they'll talk a little bit more about the configuration, but right now it comes in into a daily data entry form. Um, but once every seven days, we look at the stock on hand, stock that will expire in the next 90 days, as well as stock that will expire in 180 days. Um, whereas once a month, on the, on the last day of the month, we're pushing each item's average monthly issuance over the last three months, as well as the opening balance. So the reason that we right now are doing this every seven days is because there's you know, significant change that, that does happen at 
this kind of interval as opposed to something like each month, but we also wanted a little bit of flexibility to increase. And I think that's become much more obvious and important in the last few months with you know, pandemic response and actually needing to look at stock on hand and, and stock data every day because it's changing so quickly or it's essential to, to monitor daily. So the way that it's set up is really that a lot of the organization unit and data elements are you know, configured using standardized codes so that it is quite flexible and sustainable to be updated. Um, you know, we didn't mention, but M Supply is managed, the, the system is managed by the Medical Product Center, not the same um, team that's doing DHIS2. And so we've tried to build this flexibly so that these teams can work together in the systems that they know best. So within M Supply, which we have a couple screenshots of here, for each warehouse, we've inserted the DHIS2 organization unit code to, to know which organization to be pushing this information to. Um, as well as for each item, as I mentioned, that, that we selected, we enter a universal item code so that if the medical product center needs to adjust something about their codes or their item names, it's still, the integration is, is not breaking. Um, and then as you can see, there's this tick box where we can toggle items for the push off and on, depending on if they're needed um, and all that's really required for it to be pushed. Uh, is that the appropriate data element is set up within DHIS2. So we use a similar structure for each of these data elements, um, but this is a stock on hand example where we, we insert that code to have this linkage between the, the warehouse and the organization unit. It's coming in as aggregate data. And, and generally we started out by doing positive or zero integer values, um, but we've also learned that for certain items, um, and this is coming up with you know, vaccines or, or certain family products, you might actually be issuing portions of um, portions of an item. So looking at numbers. And then also importantly, we've started using the last value aggregation type. So even if we're pushing at infrequent intervals where it's sometimes once every seven days or sometimes more often, we can look at the most recent value. So this has really enabled you know, quite a flexible review of data elements for maybe one item you want to look at in detail or look at, you know, one location in more detail. So depending on the program, sometimes, you know, it's actually enough and, and a huge difference now that we're able to, actually, uh, able to actually see all of this data in one place. So on the left, right, you might, on the left, you might want to look at one item across multiple locations, where on the right, we're actually looking at you know, multiple items at a single location over time. And on the right, you can see we're looking at different time periods where maybe you wanna see historically the, the value at the end of a month, um, but also this week. So quite flexible to look at what I would consider kind of raw data elements. Um, but what we'll, we've also noticed and, and where we're hoping to go is to make sure that we can adjust these and, and leverage them into more actionable indicators. So it sounds like this is maybe similar to, to what some other countries that have presented so far in this academy have demonstrated, but to share a little bit about our national malaria program, which has been a, a key user of logistics data here in Laos. Um, the team has used testing and case data to develop thresholds for what their stock should be so that we can compare it to what it actually is. So they have calculated a monthly need for each of their kind of eight priority commodities using historical test and case trends, as I said, that would come from DHIS2. But then we've also, this is currently happening outside of DHIS2 so that we can also factor in kind of the seasonality and national stock minimums policy into this. I think a, a long-term vision is to figure out whether we can, can calculate this using data um, in a more automated fashion within DHIS2, but for now it takes a um, you know, few factors. And so that's happening um, outside and we're uploading the estimated monthly need into the system. And then using this to really normalize the data, right? We have stock data that might have in incredibly different scales depending on the, the facility that we're talking about but we can calculate months of stock available by looking at our stock on hand 
over our monthly need to, to normalize this and make it a bit more comparable. And so one way that the program is now visualizing this is comparing this months of stock available to maximum and minimum thresholds. I think this is you know, between three and five months, for example, for a health facility level to guide decision makers to, to be able to address stock shortages or expected expire, expiries. So we can see just from this one chart on the left, it's very easy to notice when stock is too low and an urgent resupply is needed. Also, you can quickly move over to a different item to, to see it's within range and, and that is going well. Um, but then as you can see, and with this particular example, we have quite a few items that have excess stock. And this is important to look at um, to, to reallocate. And so we can start to leverage kind of expiry data to know whether we need to move these items around or if we can actually just pause or, or adjust distributions to get this closer to the actual stock that's expected to be used within that facility. So we're wasting less, but also making sure that there's sufficient stock. So one other way that the malaria team is also utilizing this logistics data is really just um, applying a, a legend to this stock, months of stock available indicator um, to have kind of quick color coding as well for stock that's within range and, and green or kind of warning or, or stock outs with yellow and red, um, as well as potential overstocks with this blue. And so this has been, you know, we've adjusted and, and are using different visualizations based on the user's roles within the country, whether they're based within a province or, or a given district or up centrally, we need to look at different scales of this. So we've adapted a few different approaches depending on that user. One other kind of exciting opportunity that we were also exploring in Lao is actually leveraging this to not only look at what is our current stock situation, but how can we actually use this data to define the corrective action and figure out what exactly should be resupplied or, or distributed. Um, and so now there is this distribution tool developed with, with these particular commodities where we can, based on the kind of maximum stock level, which is our, our ideal stock, we want to make sure we have enough for the, the suggested months of stock on hand. Um, to calculate the quantity to distribute, we take our maximum stock threshold. So we'll take an example here of Sepan, this first health center on the list. We have 48, um, 48 of this commodity on hand. We know that we need, or ideally there's 70 within the, the facility. None of the stock are expiring. And so therefore the team needs to distribute 22 to this facility. So it's become much more actionable to have, to know not only do we need to address some kind of shortage, but how specifically can the team build those distribution plans, make sure to communicate that to the appropriate um, party and you know, really leverage DHS2 for making decisions and not only understanding the current situation. Another area where we're seeing a lot of opportunity for the logistics data and, and these um, predictors that I'm about to look at are not currently live, but we're currently figuring out you know, what's the best way to deploy them here is to you know, leverage predictors to ensure outbreak preparedness for a set of items. So this is all demonstrative data, but if we're looking at our our COVID example, um, we have our case data that's coming into the system as events, and we can see that around the country. And similarly, similarly, we can look at our logistics preparedness. So in the middle here, if we want to quickly see at all you know, the 188 warehouses within the country, you know, just to simply answer the question, do we have stock? We can use a predictor to look at the necessary set of items and if, all of them are in stock above zero. We can flag as green. We know that we urgently need to correct the, the facilities that have stock outs. And once we're able to start answering this question and make sure that at least some stock is available, 
um, at all warehouses and, and could get to the facilities that we need, we can start to ask more nuanced questions such as, do we have enough stock? And this is where we could start to compare our stock on hand data to the minimum thresholds that we've defined to say, you know, how can we make sure that this is sufficient? So we're, we're definitely, we're currently looking at this kind of indicator outside of DHIS2, um, but really think that there's a, you know, a lot to be gained to have this right next to our case data and have the same stakeholders being able to view this information in the same place rather than, than keeping it separate. So, you know, there are many ways, and I mean, this can be a significant amount of data. Uh, and so it allows this data to be used more efficiently and effectively as we have it available in DHIS2 alongside the, the programmatic data. Um, but it's really important to flag for you know, any system, but I guess in particular, this M supply implementation. Um, if they consider how the implementation is going and, and what the status is to be able to factor that into interpretation of the information. So here in LAO, the there is a national mandate for all net programs to be using M supply um, and have their stock integrated into the national system rather than their own logistics flows. Um, but that takes time and, and that's of a more recent mandate. So we're working on full integration into the system. Um, and overall, M supply is still being adopted across each of these warehouses. It's been a, a five year scale up process for us to implement this tool. But as that continues to expand and become more, kind of the, the reach is stronger. Um, right now we can look at that alongside data quality metrics, including stock integration progress, as well as M supply site activity, which you can see on the, the right of this screen. We know that you know, most sites are active and, and actively using M supply, but there are some that maybe haven't been using it within the last month. And so we need to take that into consideration when we are evaluating the logistics data that is coming from that integration. Additionally, because the, the Ministry of Health does not collect kind of individual or patient level consumption data, the M supply data that we have coming in here and the, the stock movement that it represents can be used as a proxy for consumption, um, but really, it's important to take into the take into consideration the assumption that stock is actually reaching and informed by patient needs. So with our average monthly issuance, for example, sometimes we use that as average monthly consumption, um, but it does come with a few caveats. But in in the absence of individual level patient data, this is an incredible wealth of wealth of data um, to understand what the stock situation here is in Lao. So, Going forward, um, these are just a couple examples and the malaria data is fully in use right now and this emergency operations center data is also increasingly in use. There are quite a few ways that the Ministry of Health looks to leverage integrated logistics and health management information to put this data into context and ultimately make sure that the health services in the country are reaching who they need, when they need, where they need. Um, so a few ways just to, to close of where we hope to go from here are you know, using this information to encourage and monitor this stock integration that we had mentioned, because until all the stock in the country is really flowing into the centralized system, it won't be as powerful. And once more of this information is in here, I think we can also increase the utilization of this more regular M supply data than older systems that were in place, such as this monthly aggregate data that programs are directly entering. Additionally, we'll explore the creation of some indicators to aggregate individual products into generic items. So I'm not sure if this is something that other teams have faced, but you know, for latex gloves, for example, I think there's about 28 different versions or different combinations that we have here in Lao. But sometimes we just need to answer the question, do we have any? So we'll, we'll create some summary indicators to aggregate those products. Um, we also look to create maximum and minimum thresholds for stock you know, across different programs beyond a malaria team right now 
And as I mentioned, there may be some potential to automate some of this. Um, and finally, um, we also will plan to look at stock avail availability dashboards in our emergency operations center. And this year, more than any, has highlighted how important it is to be able to have a rapid view of what's going on in the country and, and what we need to do to be prepared for not only the 19 national notifiable diseases that we have here in Laos, but other emergent ones, um, including COVID. So, yeah, I think there is really an opportunity here. And so also curious to, to hear from you guys in terms of questions or other kind of ideas that this may raise for how ELMIS data coming into DHIS2 might be helpful for your, your teams and your ministries. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll pause there, but would be happy to kind of connect further if needed. So, so cook dive for your time. And I think we'll, we'll kick that back to the group in case there are any questions that have come up. Great, thank you so much, Lauren and Dr. Chesaili. Uh, there are quite a few questions that have actually come up. Morton has been frantically typing here on Slack to try to answer some of them. And we've also added John Lewis, he's from HISP uh, Vietnam, who's been working on this project quite a lot as well to Slack to be able to answer some of the questions. But a few that I can point at you, uh, Lauren, um, is the interoperability of both systems, the M Supply and DHIS2, is it able to handle national qualification exercises for supply planning? For instance, like with malaria, HIV, or TB? Um, have you experienced any kind? Uh, yeah, so have you been able to do any kind of national qualification exercise and supply planning using the interoperability of these systems? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think right now the way that we're leveraging M supply right now is, is not to, for quantification itself, it's, it's kind of an external process. Um, I am actually here with one of my colleagues who works closely in, in some of the supply planning for the Ministry of, in Laos, so I can also speak a, kind of quickly to that. Yeah, just to point out, I think we, we know that the DHIS2 data are essential in the M supply data to informing those exercises, but I think what we're finding is that the, you know, there are definitely more complex analyses that are needed to do a good detailed forecasting um, using the data, but then applying different assumptions that, you know, definitely need to be done in a more flexible model, such as Excel or QuantumEd or whatever the program is using. Um, but the distribution tool that Lauren presented we're using for distribution planning within the country because that requires, it's a bit more predictable and it requires less detailed analysis. Um, so that's the difference between those two. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I guess that was uh, Rose, is that right? <laughs> Sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm, I'm here with Lauren. Um, just again, we're, we're working in the same space, so hop on class. Great. Well, thanks for being around and answering that question. Uh, a couple more questions. How do you handle, um, or how have you been handling the five-year rollout of M Supply across the entire country? Uh, does Lao have sites that are not using M Supply yet? So that um, our M Supply implementation began in the Ministry of Health. I, I often say, "Are oh, we work so closely with the Ministry of Health that we we are a collaborative team?" And, and Chai has been lead support for M Supply Im implementation in Laos. Um, but it began in 2015 after an initial kind of scoping to look at which LMAS we wanted to use. A big part of our decision went into being able to use the system offline and, and synchronize up to a central location. Um, when connectivity was available. And so it was a very gradual scale up um, over the course of five years. So it is complete and is in every province. Um, you know, it's central at the warehouse, it's in every province and in every district in Laos. And so as of um, about a year ago, we're fully complete and we're transitioning into, that, that means that it's installed within these sites and is used within the primary warehouse. So there's a few elements of you know, starting to integrate additional products into the system that requires you know, follow-up training and, and you know, agreements across teams to make sure that there's clear protocol for what needs to happen. Um, but a large part of our 
kind of continued monitoring is to look at that activity, which we did show. So whenever a site is not active, we I think the, the primary reasons that this happens are because some device has broken and we need to repair or replace the computer, um, or there has been staff turnover. And so the person who used mSupply has maybe left and they need a refresher training. And I would say that's the vast majority of um, reasons that sites would not be active. And so we, the, the Medical Product Supply Center has teams that, that go out and you know, provide that immediate assistance um, so that they're able to, to use it. Um, and so now that the tool is fully implemented across the country, we are shifting kind of our, our next focus on how do we best use this information because it becomes so much more powerful now that we are able to have a, a national view um, than, than just some of the sites. So there's some monitoring that's ongoing to make sure there's not kind of continued use of the, the tool, um, but you know, it's fully, fully adopted within the country otherwise. Okay, great, thanks. Um, there was a question from Robert Modi asking if there is any middleware required to achieving interoperability. And John Lewis, again from His Vietnam, um, said that no, there is actually there's no middleware middleware involved in pushing data from M Supply to DHIS2, um, which is which is pretty cool. I think a lot most folks here are probably less familiar with M Supply. Uh, Laura, could you talk a little bit about why you chose M Supply and maybe tell us a little bit more about the platform? Does it how is the costing structure? Is it open source? Um, maybe just a little bit more background on M Supply. Sure. So as I said, M Supply is provided by a company called Sustainable Solutions based in New Zealand. Um, but they work kind of have done a few implementations in Southeast Asia. Um, and so I think as I briefly mentioned, one of the, the main considerations at the time, the scoping was in 2013 and 2014. And so some of the, the situation was a bit different of what was available at the time. Um, but we, because of connectivity, certainly the ability to work offline was a, a key component of that selection. Um, but the functionalities that, that are used within the warehouse are largely kind of for distributing stock down to lower warehouses or to facilities itself, as well as receiving them within those facilities. And so we focused on being able to do that stock management. There are capacities within M Supply as a tool to do a patient level distribution. Um, and there's also now an M Supply mobile application for tablets. Um, we're not using those functionalities right now, um, as well as some other ones that are within there. It right now is a um, licensed software. And you know, depending on the, the site and whether it's offline or online capacity, it's between 500 and about $800 per, per site to use per year. Um, but the M Supply team is also doing a bit of an overhaul to their data, um, the, the database structure and, and is rebuilding it as an open source tool. Uh, and the M Supply mobile is also open source. So it's there's a few different options and iterations at this point. Um, I think now because the, the tool has grown a bit since we first started implementing um, 2014, 2015. I don't know if there's any other kind of particular questions about that one, but the the ability, we found that a lot of the ELMIS tools, um, other ones that we looked at were really strong for using in a, a single site, but maybe not this kind of national network of um, both stores themselves as well as just general customers and, and or recipients of the commodities. And so this was the best, you know, really fit all of our, our primary needs um, and has been, as I said, fully adopted. And so we'll continue to, to use this one. Um, one thing I will flag as well and the, the benefit of some of our integration as well is because uh, M Supply is limited in being able to view data from multiple stores at one time. And so that's also been a big of opportunity for DHIS2 to help us bring this information together and have a, a, a broader picture of what's going on in the country. That's a that's a great last thing to say because Martin N is asking a question. Um, is, is it correct that the integration with DHIS2 
is to tap into the track, the uh, aggregate and tracker data to cross analyze data, or is it just because M supply does not give you an adequate um, uh, report generation for commodities needed? I guess I'm kind of interpreting Martin's question a little bit more. Maybe you guys can see it as well. It's the second to last question. Um, but yeah, and I think that there's elements of both of that. I think the very immediate fix that, that now that it's implemented and, and we've launched this implementation earlier um, this year, now that it's there, we can have much more visualization um, kind of across the country. Um, but the long-term, well, three main things. One, we're able to see this information in one place to beat some of the limitations of the, the tool that we're using. Um, or of M supply, you know, two different stakeholders, and, and Dr. Chinsley, you can potentially speak to this later on if, if there's additional time or, or questions, but different stakeholders are using um, different systems. Mo most, as we said, all national programs are using DHAS2 within the country. And so that is where they're going to, uh, and we want to be able to pull this information together um, because it's the more appropriate tool for a wider audience. Um, and then third, really, and where we'll move into now is being able to do more analytics actually with the epidemiological data that's within DHIS2. So our, you know, as we were looking at earlier, there's potential to figure out what are the actual stock requirements based on cases and testing and, and some of that more nuanced information. We can start looking at population data that's also captured in there. Um, but that's, you know, as I said, very immediate uses are, are really just being able to see this breadth, but we want to be able to do this and these analytics together. That's a really good point, Lauren. I think that, you know, so many countries are just struggling to be able to just show where this, the current stock status is at each facility for each commodity. Um, and that's the most pressing concern. But I think that you all have shown that, that, that you're able to get that data. And once you get that data, you can start to mm -hmm build out these more triangulated analytics and indicators, looking at, yeah, the, the epidemiological data, the case data, the population data. Um, and that's what Malawi showed a little bit yesterday too, if folks remember, is looking at that like consumption to issuance ratio and case load to issuance ratio and using those indicators to, and, and putting those on dashboards and putting in lines and, and guidance on those dashboards as well to inform folks about, um, uh, uh, how they should respond to those. And it's one of the interesting things is those kinds of triangulated indicators are a little bit better seemingly for projecting where you will be. Um, for example, if you know that your uh, issuance, your caseload is higher this month than your issuance, then next month you can think that you might have an understock or a stock out situation. Um, and and it, it gives you a little bit more insight. And I think those are the kinds of indicators and analytics that here within DHIS2 core, we really want to be able to support those. We want to make sure that we produce the analytics and that we are able to have the ability to calculate those kinds of indicators. Um, Lauren and team, I think that we've taken up enough of your time. Thank you again so much. It was a fantastic presentation. It's been recorded. Uh, we're going to post it up on YouTube as well as on um, uh, in our Google um, Drive for everyone to be able to watch later. Um, is there any last thing that you wanted to say or anyone from John or anyone from the team that wanted to say any last words before we go into break? So I have something to say a little bit on the, how the country used the uh, DSS2 and I'm surprised because uh, in the country we are running the, 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 the World Bank project one of the indicators that we need to report to the, to the project is uh, this, the uh, essential uh, community and, and drug uh, at the health center level. And so we use the uh, DSS2 to, to, to report to the bank, but the data is come from the M-Supply, meaning that these two systems should work together closely so that we can have the information from essential uh, medicine and, and logistic report to the bank so that we have the condition that if we report the number of health center that having the and, uh, um, medicine enough for 30 days. So in certain, uh, in, in based on that report, 
uh, the country or its health facility will, will receive amount of money so that they can improve the quality of, of, of service at the health center level. That's, that's all I want to add. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Chase. I think that's gonna be the last word uh, uh, from the team in Laos. Again, thank you all so much, fantastic presentation. Uh, it has been recorded, so we'll be able to post that up in a couple of hours. Um, all right, so now I have the responsibility to give us the word of the day. So let me just put that up on the screen. Okay, so the you can all see it. Hopefully I don't need to go into presentation mode. The word of the day is ain't no mountain high enough. So ain't no mountain high enough. We're going with the theme here. And if you could, we go into the attendance on the Google Drive, fill in the words of the day, ain't no mountain high enough, and uh, make sure that you get credit for being here today. We are going to take now a short, um, it's going to be a six minute break. <laughs> All <laughs> right. We are now ready, I think, to pass the mic over to uh, Landry and Nuno. They are joining us from um, Medexis, which is kind of a, a relatively new LMIS platform, but one that we are um, working with more and more these days. So and they're going to take us through their work that they're doing uh, in Burundi, hopefully, and uh, connecting to DHIS2 as well. All right, so Laundry Nuno, you can unmute yourself, share your screen, and over to you. Hello, Nuno here. Laundry will, uh, is preparing the data screen. OK. OK, we can see it. Looks great. Landry, you may need to unmute yourself. Unmute now. Can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you, and we can see your screen. Ah, OK. So I am uh, I'm, I'm now actually in Burundi, just arrived actually here, and uh, hope that the connection stays uh, stable. Yeah, so my name is uh, Landry Medega. Um, I'm uh, working with iPlus Solutions. I've been with iPlus Solutions for, uh, for 10 years, and uh, as, uh, as then consultant in management with uh, logistics backgrounds. So today, um, we are really delighted to uh, to have that opportunity to uh, to talk about uh, our uh, use case actually and interoperability with DHS2 uh, uh, then in Burundi. So we will talk about Medexis as uh, Scott uh, already uh, uh, introduced, and then uh, this is uh, actually uh, end to end uh, visibility platform. And here, as you know, I will be presenting today with uh, my colleague uh, Nuno. Nuno Reno, then who is uh, our head developer Medexis at iPlus Solutions. So the plan today is that we'll talk about uh, a bit of Medexis story and, uh, and then uh, the needs and uh, how we came to the design also and talk about the uh, interoperability, have a quick demo of it actually with DHS2 and then a way forward and uh, question and answer. So how do, does the idea actually of Medexis uh, yeah, come? So Medexis was born based on actually uh, two main issues we have uh, identified based on our 15 years of experience as hyper solutions, uh, a Netherlands-based uh, organization, NGO. So then the first issue is about the data and information visibility and accuracy. Uh, what's then, you, you know, what you know, actually. So in that component, actually, we see uh, quickly a lack of uh, visibility throughout the entire supply chain. 
lack of uh, reliable data. Some are collected actually based on the uh, on the paper-based LMIS, but still inaccurate. You know, sometimes a three uh, can quickly be an eight actually on that paper-based LMIS. And then we saw some data also missing or, or sometimes not reported properly actually. And also uh, then a complete view of the situation uh, down there at the last mile. And then the second component actually is uh, a, a group a component of issue is actually uh, the processes and the tools. Uh, here we saw actually a lack of robust processes in, uh, in place. And also sometimes is those processes do not actually manage storage and distribution. We see also then a poor, you know, resulting yeah, in a poor forecasting and quantification because of the, uh, the, uh, the inaccuracy of the data. And also uh, some paper-based systems, a lot actually, but still used widely uh, in countries. And also where um, some electronic solutions do exist, then we see also that they are still uh, not uh, standardized and sometimes it's really uh, standalone systems. And uh, this is the reason as to why then we uh, came to a new uh, idea of uh, creating from scratch then an ELMIS system, you know, and that is uh, and complementing it with our experience, our 15 years experience in supply chain management, you know, uh, and uh, so combining actually the technology and logistics. So here we see the reason, uh, one of the reasons few reasons, as you see here, is that we experienced some systems uh, before coming to our, our new LMIS. Uh, we have team up with, uh, with uh, great organizations and where we saw actually at the end of the day with that uh, some of the systems we use or country use actually uh, are not user friendly sometimes, you know, and, and some are expensive as well at the end of the they um, to sustain actually in country where resources are really uh, limited. And then we see also that there are some uh, commercial and open source or open source uh, platforms. And then which uh, actually at the end of the day, some of them uh, are not owned by the country at the end of the day. And, uh, and then not having also all the key features actually a such system needs in country to manage the proper uh, ELMIS uh, data. And then uh, the, the, as you see see, and, and, and one of the colleagues already mentioned it, we see now that the HS2 uh, now is in every almost uh, uh, in uh, 100 uh, countries, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And, uh, and then, so we need actually as a new system or as a ELMIS system to, to, to integrate with the access. And then, so we see in country that uh, there is no correlation between then the clinical data uh, uh, collected greatly by, uh, by the HS2 and logistical data actually in country. And then we see also some poor customer satisfaction rates, uh, mainly at the central medical store. And here I'm talking about the Burundi one uh, is around 30%, you know? So imagine you come with a product and then uh, you, had, you have to, 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 to find alternative for the 70% uh, of the rest of the product on, on your list actually, because they're simply not available at central medical store. And then uh, we see also a long procurement lead time actually at that central medical store. This is for various factors, you know, and, uh, and then the lengthy, is it lengthy process? And, uh, and it's about uh, tender in a public sector, you know, and, uh, and then resulting in an, an, in an average of 367 days actually to, to have uh, the process completed actually and, 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 and good delivered. And so recurrent uh, stock outs, uh, overstocks and a lot of expiries. 
So then we came to design uh, an experiment uh, with Lexis in Burundi. So we first then created actually uh, go globally, we decided to create then a Medici to design it in 2018, and then based on our experience, as I already said, and then also from a bottom up uh, uh, approach, actually. Yeah, then uh, we place then the, uh, the one who is manipulated the product actually in the center of our uh, intervention and uh, in the center of that design you know, and to make the system really friendly so that we can then uh, 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 gain also time actually to dedicate to other duties. And then we then team up with our technological partner XNR in Portugal and came to design Medexis. So in Medexis, after implementation, uh, you can see that Medexis provides visibility in the entire supply chain, you know, this is, for example, how we show stock out in red, for example, you know, so that you can, uh, you as a, a, a worker can then take an action and uh, and make sure that you get the product available. Uh, and also, we piloted then Medexis one year after, in 2019 in Burundi, covering actually uh, in total, 13 products. Then is uh, is more a family planning product, uh, one abortion, post abortion care product, and and some nutrition product as well. Where then we we then uh, at the at the health facility level, we covered then 133 health facilities, and uh, and each of them actually have has uh, 9,000 uh, average. Per uh, health facility cover than 9,000 uh, patients uh, at health facility on average, and then um, and then we cover also 13 districts uh, uh, in the country out of uh, 47, uh, and about the health facilities, the 133 is out of 100 is out of 1,336 in total in country, and then also the central medical store. And here, we then, uh, besides providing the system and testing the system actually, we also implement then our approach, you know, of capacity building and coaching on the job as well. So the, where we developed then a user guide and training modules. And then we trained first, then six master trainers, and then in total 89 users, and developed together with them then a monitoring and supervision framework. And also where then by we could then measure performance as we progress. And then we developed also inventory and stock management reporting tools and different dash dashboards then to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, uh, those actually inform uh, uh, decision uh, uh, to be taken and also uh, coached then and supervised the district executive team and in total to 240 uh, healthcare providers. You know, we have um, increased the number, as the, the number as this because we wanted to make sure because of the fact, or because of the turnaround time in staffing, actually in public sector, in the Burundi health public sector, then we had to to, to train at least two people then uh, at the health facilities and make sure that uh, uh, somebody remains and uh, and uh, to to continue doing the work. So so far. Uh, what we have seen actually is that uh, the availability has increased here, uh, then uh, for, you know by 14 uh, percent and uh, coming from a baseline of 80 percent, 85 percent because or because uh, at that baseline uh, uh, coincides with uh, with uh, with the replenishment of the uh, facilities. So uh, the level was high already from there. So we had to take up take on the challenge and then bring it then to 99% page, uh, 99% uh, at the end of December uh, uh, of last year. 
And then a stock out, the stock out here is that we measure it by health facilities, experiencing stock out. And here you can see that, that you know, they've been reduced substantially uh, while using Medexis, then from 94% actually to, to 8% uh, at the end, uh, the, uh, the end of the, uh, the, the, the experimentation. And, uh, and here uh, about the expiries, uh, we see them reduce significantly as well, then by 85% reduction, that cost a lot. And uh, so, uh, and the, you can see that the 3% at the end of December you see here is, uh, is because uh, there were a batch of uh, product actually, uh, which, uh, and that was misoprostol, they call it actually uh, a post abortion care uh, a post product, then that uh, was about to, to expire in any way. And then we had so many uh, volume actually uh, at that time at those health, health facilities. And then the overstock has reduced here slightly. Uh, we wanted to put it here because it's also a good lesson learned for us. Because here, what we see is that uh, we came to know about the, uh, a, 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 for example, a female condom, uh, which is uh, really in low consumption because of that low consumption that we had then uh, over that that then uh, informed the decision uh, to to make sure that uh, then they change strategy in demand creation for that specific product. You know. So now I will share with you the lesson learned uh, during the implementation. Uh, we categorize that they're actually in two group groups. The technical groups. Uh, and uh, a technical group and behavioral and uh, skills. So about the technical group, you can see that the use of another computer is really dedicated because here um, in Burundi, um, luckily all the, most of the health facilities, all, all of them actually have uh, at least one computer. They do have one computer. Sometimes that computer is not functioning well or is second hand computer, uh, but somewhere, but they do have a computer. And then is the um, uh, uh, chief nursing then using that computer. And uh, sometimes he attends meeting with that computer, you know, going around. And then uh, the responsible pharmacist then uh, exper experienced the delays actually in keying uh, the records actually for the, um, for the, uh, the LMI. So we have, so here we think that a second computer dedicated only for pharmacy is needed. Uh, and then now we see also that uh, the data were then recorded uh, accurately and uh, that was good. Uh, and uh, also uh, we've, uh, we haven't foreseen actually the, I recall data validation uh, at that time but then we managed to create then sort of units, uh, um, uh, units at the district level, then to review and then analyze and, and, uh, and, uh, and make sure that they validate together then data collected actually from health facilities of the area of information. So that was also a good lesson learned for us. Uh, uh, so that when data is validated from there, it can be uh, sent to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the central level. And then the internet connectivity is really essential here. We see that uh, it's important to have a well internet, good con internet connectivity, and then to make sure that uh, you report then, uh, uh, you see your data actually on re in real time. Where internet uh, connectivity is not available, actually, uh, the system is able then later to then uh, synchronize and then make sure that data actually uh, keyed then can be uh, uh, viewed then in real time when connectivity is back. And uh, about the behavior uh, uh, here, we see some resistance to change. Uh, we were expecting this actually, but not a lot was really not significant actually uh, because of the fact that people were really high motivated 
actually uh, to use Medexis and because they have seen uh, uh, the benefit from it. And, uh, and for example, where they were spending actually two weeks uh, to, to, to reorder for replenishment, we managed to bring it down because of the use of Medexis down to three hours in total, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, so that was they could dedicate then uh, the gain uh, in time actually clinical aspect. Uh, and then the, um, we have seen then, as I already mentioned here, the, uh, the, that uh, significant reduction in time. Uh, we have also experienced uh, some health, you know, the level of computer literacy of the health of some of the health workers was really uh, problematic sometimes. You know, for example, we had to work with a really high motivated uh, 55 years old uh, responsible pharmacist who has never touched a, you know, a computer before. And uh, but he's, uh, he's really good in maintaining uh, records actually on paper-based LMIS. So we have then uh, reached an agreement with the chief nursing uh, who can then uh, manipulate a computer. Then to after the uh, responsible pharmacist has, is, has finished then uh, the uh, paper-based LMIS, then to help him assist here in keying actually uh, the data in the system and which was really do, done then uh, in, uh, every day, every time then they, uh, they uh, actually dispense then the, uh, the product. So here I will then give the uh, word to my colleague uh, Nuno about the interoperability uh, demo. Okay, let me share my screen and go with it. Okay, I believe you can see my screen right now. Yes, uh, yes, I can see your login screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So what we are presenting today is a bit of a, a proof of concept that we are developing together with the MOH in, in Burundi, as well as with DHIS2. Um, uh, so we can have full interoperability between Medexis and, and DHIS2. So let me just log in here. Okay, I won't go through the, the normal process of explaining Medexis, so just cut to the, to the chase. So we have this um, configuration page where we define a, a number of, of um, information that is coming from, from the, the current um, uh, structural data in, in Burundi. So this is a one-time configuration. And we do have the, the, um, the facilities. So uh, the idea here uh, within our, our um, development was to be able to use the pre-existing DHIS2 um, structure uh, with facilities or, or and and commodities uh, as well. So um, there is no need to configure both uh, uh, the the facilities in both uh, platforms, as we can just uh, um, seek all of the data from DHIS2 and then import it in in Medexis. Um, automatically by simply by clicking of a, of a button. Same thing with the commodities, where in here we can have the option to import the commodities that are created in DHS2, as well as export the, the commodities that are created in Medexis into DHS2. 
So in this case, if we want to import, let's say this product, we just import the data and then fill all the, the, um, all the necessary information to import and create this commodity in, in Medexis in a, in a really easy way to, to, to reach the um, interoperability between the two uh, platforms. Okay, so now uh, we have in DHS2 one data entry uh, uh, page that let's say for January or for March, where we have a number of uh, products, then stock on hand, monthly consumption, and Medexis received. So uh, all the commodities that have entered the the the, the stock of the of the facility, and and this is DHS two. So if we go to November. We don't have any data yet. And let's sync the month receipts from um, Medexis into uh, DHS2. So we have a number of uh, items that have arrived in, in, the, in this facility inside Medexis, and we can just export all of them into DHS2. And if we just refresh the page and go here, we have the Medexis receipts here, and we have the same for all of the three options. So in this proof of concept, we are doing this manually to, to have full control over the, the, the information, but in a, at a later stage, the idea is to do this automatically and without any human intervention um, every, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of uh, the week, something like that, depending on the, on the needs. And here, if we go to November, we have the stock on hand. And with all this data, we can then process the, the, the data on the DHS2 side and go from there. Also, we do have the, the ability to not only send data to um, to DHIS2, but also to retrieve data that uh, is saved in DHIS2. So let's go with April. And what the system does is reaches DHIS2, grabs the data and uh, shows it here. You can see on April. So the consumption is the, the same on on the two sides and we just validate the consumption and import this data into Medexis to then um, use it for the re replenishment uh, process inside uh, Medexis. So same thing with the end balance, same, same process. We select the facility, the month that we want to import and go from there. Um, obviously, um, this is, as, as, as I said in the beginning, just the proof of concept uh, and we can work with any variables that we want to pass from Medexis into the HIS2, as well as receive any data that is available in the HIS2 and import it in Medexis to be presented. So at this point, there is no mountain high enough for, for us 
to, to, to really achieve the interoperability between the two platforms. Okay, so now I will stop sharing and pass the, the, um, the discussion to Landry. If you have any questions, please feel free to, to, to make them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott, do you want to do the questions? Yeah, sure. So um, seems like quite a lot of folks also interested in this as well. A few questions. Is it time for questions, guys? Uh, Laundry, did you have anything else to add or are you ready for questions? Yeah, we have uh, one more. Um, so point four with some, some uh, text on the conclusion and the way forward for us. Sure. So no, go go ahead. Yeah, we've we've got some time. So go ahead. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, then we see uh, Medexis actually as um, uh, as an LMIS as a key tool actually to ensure continuous availability uh, of uh, products uh, here uh, to the last mile and uh, and uh, and. Uh, and thereby then ensure actually sufficient and permanent accessibility to the most vulnerable segments of the population uh, here to, uh, to the product uh, they really need actually. And, um, and then uh, the way forward here is that uh, we extend then Medex as, as I said, then uh, to nutrition products and now extending it to, to, uh, to immunizations as well as, uh, as of uh, end of this month, actually. And then with funding from UNICEF. And also then it will be then, uh, it will be seven additional health districts covering then the 90 uh, health facilities in total. And then uh, we are also uh, actually engaged uh, in discussions actually with the government and waiting for this, their decision then to adopt one single national integrated ELMIS for all commodities actually in country. Uh, you know. so, and also then we, now that we have achieved that uh, great milestone with interoperability with the HS2, we would like to, to continue and have a full and proven interoperability with SAGE system here in country as well. Why SAGE? Because SAGE is actually uh, the main used uh, uh, system uh, by the uh, central medical store. So right now that SAGE, that system of the central medical store doesn't talk to the yes, too. So this is something we want to see if then uh, Medexis can uh, play a role there and then, you know, and then sort of interface and then uh, 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 talk to, uh, to, to both, both systems. So um, thank you very much. And uh, so this is now time for, yeah, I will, I will give the word actually to the moderator here. Yeah, thank you. Landry Nuno, thank you so much for the for the great presentation. Quite a lot of interest and questions coming in on the community or on the uh, Slack channel. So let me just throw some of these at you here. Um, the first one is, is the connection between Medexis and DHIS2 achieved directly or do you have to use any kind of middleware? Um, it's directly. So it's great. programmed, let's say, in, within Medexis. Yeah, and it's configurable, yeah. That's great. And, you know, for those of you who have probably attended several DHIS2 academies in the past, you've never had, uh, we've never had another platform present during an academy before. And in this academy, you've seen that we've had a little bit from OpenLMIS, last presentation on mSupply, and then we're actually having the lead developers and implementation team of Medexis actually present to you. And that's because we appreciate with DHIS2 that we have to work with these platforms to be able to cover the use cases um, uh, um, for supply chain. DHIS2 can't work alone here. We need, to, we need to collaborate. And that's why we're having this kind of bilateral communication and working directly with, with these platforms, specifically Medexis uh, quite a lot right now. 
Okay, some more questions. Um, does Medexis have an offline version? Uh, we have the offline version in the mobile app, and we are working on version 2.0 of the, the web portal to be able to work completely offline. Yeah. So soon we will be able to, to have uh, offline capabilities both on the, on the app as well as on the, on the web platform. Right. Okay, great. Um, another question is, um, can you go over a little bit more about how Medexis handles receipts? Yeah, sure. Um, we have uh, probably best if I screen share again or something like that. So we have the, the, um, the normal process, the, the health facility, uh, places a requisition that it's validated on the on the higher level and then once the the requisition for certain commodities are, are um, uh, validated then no no you can you can share your screen now if you'd like ah, to okay. actually just show it yeah okay so let's share screen Okay, are you seeing my screen right now? Yep. Yeah, okay. So what we do, and obviously these data entry are all the data entry that are possible in the system. Depending on the role of each user, he will be seeing uh, one or, or other data entry. Uh, but since I'm logged in as admin, I have the, the, the option to see all of the available data entry. So, uh, and we have uh, organized this in a very sequential way, let's say. So the, requisite, the, the, um, the health facility creates a requisition that passes through validation from a, a higher level, as I was saying, and once this requisition is validated, it then turns into an order with allocation and allocation here is automatically suggested by the system based on FIFO and FEFO uh, algorithms, then goes through the picking and packing process. And once it's, it's packed, it creates automatically a shipment then you can uh, uh, arrange those shipments into consignments and those consignments are then uh, um, distributed and validated at uh, the, the health facility when they arrive. So starting from there, you can do your consumption, write up, transfer stock, and this is the transfer stock within the same facility. You also have the inter-facility transfer. We can look at this one. So we have different options for the inter-facility transfer. That could be a normal transfer. Let's say you are uh, redistributing some products that you are that you have in overstock, and you are uh, on. Uh, distributing them to, to another facility nearby, or you have the option to do the stock return. So uh, if the items are were cold, or uh, if they need to go back to, to central medical store, then you can have a, a stock return that only follows, or you can only, um, send those products into the, the facilities that are defined in the facility supply path. So we have every facility with a supply path that is organized uh, by program if necessary. Uh, and then we can, the, the stock return works inside that supply path only. 
Then we have the normal inventory checkup and also the system based on, on the consumption, uh, the system can suggest the, the, um, the inventory settings, which are the, the inventory levels defined for that, uh, the, for that commodity. So the reorder level, the em uh, emergency uh, uh, order level, and the maximum level of, or, or optimal level. So then depending on the consumption over a period of time, the system can say, okay, you may need to, to readjust the, the, um, the inventory settings that you have defined for this product. Uh, also, you have the option when there is no, uh, um, no inventory on the supply path to uh, accept or, or to register some products that you have bought outside of the normal supply path. So we have two ways uh, to, to answer the question. Uh, we have two ways of, tre uh, of receiving items. One is through the whole process here with the requisition and then go through all of the steps. And the other one is to directly add uh, items that were uh, purchased outside of the, of the um, supply path. Yeah, Great, okay. That answers the, the question. Yeah, very thoroughly. Thank you so much. Um, a couple of other questions. Would you guys be able to say a little bit about how much it costs to use Medexis? Yeah, Do you have I will, I will pass to, to Landry. So if you have any technical questions for, for myself, I'm happy to, to answer all of those and then we pass to, to, to Landry, if that's okay with you. Yes, uh, thank you, Nuno. Uh, actually, um, yeah, Medexis, uh, as you know, we developed Medexis from uh, on uh, our uh, from scratch, then on um, uh, from our resources. So we had to use uh, from start then uh, licensing fee. But now we work in actually hardly, you know, on in 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 changing actually that model uh, so that we make it affordable. Actually you know, to meet also our vision and mission, you know, of the organization. And, uh, and then uh, we will then uh, be offering uh, this uh, product uh, from now on because it's almost finalized. Uh, we will offer it then, uh, uh, you know, based on, on uh, case by case, of course, but then, then we'll be uh, uh, on uh, open sort of uh, um, um, affordable, like uh, using a, a freemium. Uh, then to yeah. see. Uh, Sorry, laundry, you're, you're, you're going. Sorry, laundry, you're, you're going in and out. Oh, you I'm said that you're going to use a freemium model. Okay. Yes, maybe, yeah. maybe I can. Uh, I can... Uh, answer since laundry has some connectivity issues. Uh, um, we are on the upcoming version. We will be applying the freemium model. So Medexis will be free with some basic uh, um, capabilities. And then the countries can buy uh, uh, specific uh, uh, modules to enchant the, 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 the free uh, capabilities. So that's the idea in the, in the up upcoming months. Right. But, uh, but right, and that, that's, a, that's a fairly standard model, I, I would say. Um, uh, so the freemium model. So, but I plus solutions is a nonprofit, correct? You're not a for-profit yep. company. Okay. Correct. We are a non-profit uh, organization. Correct. Great. Okay. A so few the, more questions. So the, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Scott. Yeah. So then the, uh, the, the most important thing for us is actually to just cover our cost. If we can cover our cost, then it's fine, actually. Uh, yeah. Cover our costs and then meet, meet uh, the mission and vision of the organization. And that's it. 
Wonderful, wonderful, great. A few more questions here in the last uh, several minutes that we have. Um, how does the Medexa system calculate the need for each site? Do you have different methods um, to calculate the different consumption data or caseload data to calculate uh, the need for each yeah, site? In, in, in this case, we have this option to, to define the, um, the needs for, for the, the um, based on what I've told about, about the emergency level the reorder level and the maximum slash optimal uh, level and depending on that the system um when when the the so let me show you here on the requisition uh, if you select the facility and then let's see if this is a bit out of the so the system automatically, based on your stock on hand and the maximum levels that are defined by, by program, the system can suggest that you should order, in this case, these two items. You know? And the system suggests these, the, the, the stock on order and the quantity needed to reach the, the, the optimal stock level. Great, okay. And then I think we have time for one last question. Um, are the picking and packing, creating shipments, managing shipments, consignment modules, are those working? Um, and, yeah. are, okay, maybe you could, uh, yeah, I think yeah, you've yeah. actually- I, I can this. go through all of them, I didn't do did it because of, of the time for, for the answer. So in this case, so let me start in the beginning. So here you have a couple of requisitions that are still waiting to be validated. Let me grab one. And in here you have all the information about the, the requisition. So the destination facility, who, from the, the defined supply path for this uh, facility, who will be the facility that will uh, provide these, these items. Also the information about the available budget and the requisition cost. And you have here the information on the, the items that are still in the pipeline. So they have been validated uh, but they have not yet uh, uh, reached the, the facility. So you can have a clear idea on the amount of, of uh, or the, the value of the products that are still in the pipeline to be, to be delivered. And based on that, you can um, reject the, the requisition or validate it and submit for, for allocation. Once you pass this, this stage, uh, the order now can be allocated and the system automatically, as, as, as I said earlier, based on FAFO and FIFO algorithms, um, the system automatically calculates or, or uh, uh, defines the, the best batch that should be sent in this case. So the batch and the expiration date, and also the location where it is in the origin facility. Okay, if there is need for it, uh, the stock, so in this case, the, the system, uh, since we have stock on, on origin facility, the system automatically sends all that, that was uh, validated before all, all, all items, but the user that is allocating can ration some of these. So if we click here, what we change is uh, we can change the quantity we send and we then create uh, or this order uh, stays open until we fulfill the, the um, the, the quantity that we need. Once we have this allocated, it goes to the picking and packing. 
Let me see if we can. Okay, so this one is for um, uh, we have this. We just need to mark it as picked and packed, assuming that we have packed the the whole quantity, and then we we need to add the packing information. So the number of boxes, the weights, the the um, cubic meters, uh, the volume in cubic meters, or you can just uh, short close it because it was not found in that location. Once the, the picking and packing is, is done, we can then create the shipment. So based on the origin facilities, you then have, okay, I have two consignments that I need to send. Uh, in this case, both are going to the same place. Let me try to find one with multiple destinations here. Yeah, this one. So we have um, multiple consignments and multiple destination facilities. And you just mark them, okay, I want to send all of these. And you have your shipment information that you can then use to, to program the couriers and, uh, and things like that. So the managed shipments is once the shipment is done, you have this different status that is waiting for transportation data, where you define the, let me see if I can find one with some data, okay. Where you have the information on the consignments that are um, allocated to this shipment and you can add the transportation details. So the planned departure date, the courier name, the license plate, and the loading capabilities. And after that, once it's, uh, the transportation details are, are saved, you just need to go back and confirm that this information is, is correct and uh, the shipment is now loaded and in transit. Okay, um, Nuno, I'm gonna have to cut you off there, yeah, uh, yeah, but I yeah, think yeah. it seems like a, that you have a very clearly defined and comprehensive process built into yeah. the workflow. Uh, just to reiterate that these, you know, the reason that we're, we're, we're letting Medexis go through these functionalities uh, is that these are functionalities that DHIS2 does not have, and DHIS2 will not have, uh, at least in the near future, uh, in the foreseeable future. And so if you, if these are functionalities that you need to manage your supply chain, you need to look to using tools like Medexis um, uh, to, to complete these, to, to be able to cover this, this use case. Um, there is one question from, last question from Shafiq, which I will answer. Uh, they are asking if, um, we could use DHS2 data like caseload data to inform um, uh, uh, supply and ordering and, and supply chain data. Um, yes, we want to be able to do that in the future. We're going to be working closer with Medexis, um, hopefully in the Burundi use case, maybe some other countries to be able to push and pull data between the systems so that potentially in the future we could be using caseload data instead of consumption data. Um, for some of the resupply and, and calculations going on within Medexis. Um, with that, uh, Laundry Nuno, thank you again so much. It was a really wonderful presentation. It have, has been recorded. We'll post it up on YouTube. We will also put it on the Google Drive. Um, Nuno, special thanks to you for incorporating the word of the day into your presentation. And again, <laughs> that word of the day is ain't no mountain high enough. Please go and mark your attendance. Type in ain't no mountain high enough high enough um just like the song and um and that will get your credit for being here today um okay, thank you. yeah no thank you martin alice any additional things that i'm forgetting uh maybe we can remind that the experts lounge for asia will be held tomorrow instead of today Right. Yeah. So that was scheduled for today. We're going to be able to do it tomorrow. So if you're joining us from Asia or you're just interested to find out a little bit more about what Lao has done in their use case, um, 
uh, um, John Lewis from His Vietnam will be available to answer those kind of questions for you. Um, with that, I would say that all the presentations will also be uploaded so that you can get the contact details from any of the presenters that you've seen here today. If you'd like to reach out to them and, and talk about maybe using Medexis or um, understanding a little bit more about the M supply use case in Laos, uh, uh, they have made those contact information available through their presentations. With that, we I know we're a bit over time. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for staying on the line. We will be... Scott, yeah. Sorry. Just one thing, I'm going to copy in the chat the link to the feedback form. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm always forgetting something. The feedback form is very important to us. We do take a look at that every day. So uh, please do provide us some feedback and we appreciate that sincerely. Yes, we do. And then anything else, Alice? Are we okay? I think we're okay now. Okay. All right. Thanks for keeping me on track. Um, then we will call it a day. Again, thank you all for joining day four. Tomorrow, we will be right back here at the same time, 11 o'clock Oslo time, and we will be going through how to actually configure DHIS2 to, to be able to produce some of these indicators that you've seen Malawi and, um, and Lao uh, show. So that'll be exciting for you to be a bit more technical. So if you're not a DHIS2 technical person, you might get lost quite quickly, unfortunately. But if you know how to configure indicators already, you know a little bit about the DHIS2 architecture, you should hopefully be able to hang with me.